I'm John Travis in Mullumbimby, New South Wales on the 7th of April, 2021, talking to Sally Cusack, and I'm not even sure, but am I pronouncing it correctly? Well, we say Cusack. Cusack, okay. Uh, uh, the, there's the movie star, yeah. who I'm sure is a close relative. Um, yeah. But I've never been sure. Well, uh, now that we've uh, uh, dealt with that, <laughs> And you're just down the road here in Byronshire at Cooper Shoot. So we're in the same time zone, which is nice. And um, I met you, what, about 10 years ago, I think, uh, at that workshop down uh, where Robin was speaking down at the, um, um, oh, uh, Suffolk Park. It was uh, the Conscious Parenting. Yeah. Yeah. It and was the uh, Conscious Parenting Natural Learning Conference. Right, and Scott Noel was there too, I think. Um, my old buddy from- Yeah, yeah, I, that's amazing. Two years, it's amazing it's 10 years ago now. At least, I think it, it might've been 11 or 12. Mm. But um, so, and I've been on your show on Bay FM a couple of times. So we've uh, gotten to know each other a little bit, but today we're gonna dive into who you are and why. Uh, you're, I consider the second generation of the uh, infant wellness, um, you know, the, the women I met at the Mother Friendly Childbirth Initiative who are all now in their 60s, 70s and 80s. Some of them have died actually. That was my introduction to the, the whole field um, after learning about attachment parenting and uh, so forth. So, um, and I'm so glad that you and many of your colleagues have taken up the cause and are bringing fresh blood into the, into the arena. So I'm gonna find out how you came to be uh, um, <clears throat> the mover and shaker that you are. So it's just started pouring rain here. I may have to mute myself if it gets too loud, but let's start with where you were born, uh, siblings, uh, what your early childhood was like, what influences <clears throat> directed you in the, in the area that you've chosen. So take it away. Well, I'm one of six children. I'm the first daughter, um, the second child, um, to a couple who um, loved each other to the end. Um, and uh, they weren't without their challenges in their own childhoods. And um, they got together very young and there was never lots of money around, um, but there was always lots of family and lots of love and, and some dysfunction thrown in there too. <laughs> um, but they were, my parents were a real product of the, the sort of the traumas of that particular generation. So my parents in the last couple of years have passed on um, but they were pre-war and wartime babies. So my mum was um, born in Northern Queensland in 1942. And apparently as she was being born, her mother could hear the, the Battle of the Coral Sea happening out in the ocean with the Japanese um, at the time she was given birth, giving birth. Um, wow. So Australia came quite, quite close to invasion in a, you know, there and Darwin and Sydney, yeah. there were some close interactions. And, um, and my father was born in 1937, just before the, the Second World War in the UK. And um, his father, his parents migrated with their eight children to Australia in 1949. And it, it was a really disruptive, difficult time, I think, that the early childhood for both of my parents. And um, I, I, as an adult, I can look back and see the influence of um, the lack of indi individualized care and attention that they could get because each parent their parents 
was struggling just to keep food on the table. Mm-hmm. And and so anyway, they 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 did their best. Um, they met each other very young, and um, started having children quite quickly. And um, they didn't have any mentoring or um, parental support, really. In fact, my mother had to nurse my um, my dad's parents as when she was a new mother. Um, my dad's parents started to fall ill and she had them in the home as well as me as a toddler and my younger sister as a tiny baby and my older brother not very old himself you know he was just a young child and so you know it was really it was a difficult time and um anyway just hopping forward a little bit into major influences I um I had a major influence for me was my schooling my especially the my infants and primary school period I was taught by nuns my family was my parents were Catholic and uh, so I'm 50 I was born in 1968 so I'm 52 now and there were the last vestiges of the really old school fairly brutal Catholic um, education that was in place and yeah it was pretty scary and brutal um, was that in but there were aspects of it no no so my parents both individually when my father migrated from from England they settled in Grafton and then later Lismore yeah. so I, I have a lot of family in this area and then he moved down for his university years and they met at Sydney University mm-hmm. and my mum my mum moved down from Queensland and they just met there and my dad was actually working they met because my dad was working for my mum's dad he was a he was a um he was a doctor and he specialized in pathology and um he headed up the school of um tropical medicine and public health at sydney university and did lots of research into identifying diseases and their causes was that your father or your grandfather we had this my grandfather uh-huh. yeah yeah so that was his that was his principal work during the war I think he, he did a lot of work um, with identifying diseases that were affecting the armed forces in the tropics um, and uh, there's actually a lab in um, the school of tropical health and sorry tropical medicine and public health they, they still have a building as far as I know in Rockhampton where my mum was born and, and my grandfather was working and about 15 years ago I was visiting Rockhampton and just thought oh let's just have a little look in, like is this building still here and it was there with all the it's disused I, I yeah all the like little scales and the wooden cabinets everything was still there and, but they're working out of there's some sort of it's still owned by the government but they're working in a more modern building next door mm. so bizarre anyway my um yeah so my my grandfather was working um running this lab like it was a big lab with lots of young science students who assisted in there they could get some extra money doing helping with the tests the testing and cleaning the equipment and so on and my dad worked here and he heard about um dr forbes's beautiful young daughter and (laughs) they just happened to meet and then my dad then my dad just pursued her and he had no money the only clothes he had were his um he called it the Nashos. There was still um, national service in those days, and he had to do national service around that time. So all he had was his national service uniform <laughs> to go well, to uni and just live his life. 
they say. Sorry? They say uniforms are pretty sexy. Oh, well, yeah, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what my mum thought of all of that. But anyway, she, he talked around. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, it's like these things. I know I'm talking about old history here, but it's, it's just important. amazing how, yeah, like it get it's trauma is intergenerational or, or you know the positive things it, it gets passed on as we now know and we also now know that i was in my grandmother when my mum you know because of my mum being a fetus in her mother she had all her eggs by the time she was like I don't know, 25 weeks gestation or something like that. So I was in there. I was mm -hmm. in my, my grandmother. Um, or half of you was anyway. Half of me, yeah, that's right. So uh, there's a bit of a story about my grandmother. I, I don't know how much I should say about that. She didn't, uh, it's not something really, talked about much in my family so I don't know how much to talk about it in this setting um, but one of her children my mum was one of four she was the youngest child and she had three older brothers and the oldest one is still alive um, and yeah so yeah but she didn't she didn't live for very long after my mother was born and my mum grieved for her every day of her life, even though she has no memory of her. And my mum was just a toddler when oh. she died. And she, she was then put into an orphanage and uh, like her dad just couldn't cope with the death. And <clears throat> um, yeah, I think she, my mum went on to develop asthma and she had asthma all her life it was quite severe and at the end of she eventually died with um or of copd chronic obstructive mm -hmm. obstructive pulmonary disorder um and asthma is linked to grief so you know these things are you know have the effects are profound and and I, I carry, I like, I carry her grief. Yeah. Um, and so this work, the, oh, I get a bit emotional. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah, fine. No, let it, let it flow. <laughs> it's real. Yeah, yeah, it's real. And also my dad's mum was very, you know, much a product of her time. And I think she never, I don't think she had any say in migrating to Australia. Uh, I'm sure she could see that things were going to be better and England was just so torn apart. Mm -hmm. um, but my sense is that for, from the little bits that I heard, I have vague memories of her. She was four, I was four when she died. And she, she seemed to really believe in fairies and like in the plant world and she, it, it likes quite, I don't know, kind of like what's the term, sort of pagan, kind of really old England. She was from um, the south and from the coast, from the coastline down there and used to spend a lot of time in a little rowboat by herself, even in storms and apparently, you know. Um, and she used to consort a bit with the people that they used to call gypsies, the traveller people. And um, I, I, she's, yeah, she used to say stuff like when, when I was little and people would dismiss, oh yeah, she's like, she believed that little babies could see, they were looking at angels. You know, when the, their eyes are a bit 
drifty on a little newborn baby. Oh, yeah, they're just, they're just looking at the fairies, that, but soon they won't be able to see them. And she suffered a lot of mental illness. And um, when she, well, I think it started to set in in her later babies. So she had eight, very, like one after the other. And she, I don't think she was really supported in that process. And it sounds like piecing it together, she wasn't really supported. And my, my grandfather was a very typical army. He was in the army and just, you know, this is the way we run things. Let's go to Australia. He'd met, he loved the Australian soldiers that he met during his time in the army and sort of imagine this amazing paradise that they could move to. And he got some sponsorship from soldiers that he'd met here. Like, so there were a couple of different people willing to sponsor people migrating out here after the war. And I don't think my grandmother had any say in that. And I don't think she ever recovered from being torn away from her land there. And um, yeah, so like the women in, in my family line have not had an easy time. Um, so, yeah, it's through the sort of jumping forward a bit, uh, like a lot, really, I'll jump forward to my births. It's through those birth experiences that I've been able to learn so much about myself and how I think about things. And, but also it's helped me interpret my past and the influence that my past has had on me. And when we have this awareness, you know, if you have an awareness of something, it dissipates. Like if you have an awareness of a negative influence, just shining a little light on it and going, oh, is that why I do this or feel that way or carry, carry something? It, doesn't it no longer ha has that same weight um so i have through all the people like you jack and and uh and scott noel and um uh and uh, uh robin grill who i also met and interviewed um at that same conference for the first time i've interviewed him since as well but through all the people that I've met in this arena of birth and parenting, um, where it's all about deep inquiry into our beginnings and how to make them better and more meaningful and to correct this mess that there's like a lot of mess around, um, that I've been able to learn so much more about myself and I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, my birth experiences were extremely pivotal, um, as well as meeting my, my partner, my husband, who's been an amazing influence in my life. We met very young at the end of high school. Oh. And, yeah, yeah, so we, we, we've just being able to, he's just always felt like home to me. And even with all the struggles, it's not like it's been easy and every day is a picnic. It's a garden we have tended every day. And sometimes it's like, I don't feel like tending that garden. <laughs> um, but no, it always is worth it. And we've just learned so much together. And well, it's been such a privilege to be able to really talk Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to uh, uh, go back to your birth, and, and it's great that we've uh, you've got such a supportive relationship, and we'll we'll see how that develops uh, a little bit. But was was your birth um, hospital, a home? Uh, what sort of um, experience? Anything you remember, or what you know about it? 
Yeah, so um, you're talking about me birthing my children as opposed to my birth, I take it. No, no your birth. Uh, we haven't heard any specifics about your birth other than the coral, uh, uh, that was your mother's birth with the Battle of the Coral Sea. Yeah. Okay, so a bit about my birth. Well, it's yeah. funny you ask because about six months ago, I requested my birth records from the hospital that I was born at. And it was quite a process because the hospital no longer exists as a hospital. The actual building is now, I think it's a block of units or something. Um, and so it took a lot of digging for the local health district to find the records. Um, I was born at the Mater Hospital in Sydney. Um, it's near North Sydney. And uh, run by an order of nuns. And um, look, my mum, I don't think she had great birth experiences. Uh, yeah, my dad couldn't be there, not that he would have really you know, in those times, the dad didn't go in. So you were just greeted by people you didn't know and put in a room by yourself. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of awful stories that you hear. I don't think she had twilight medication or anything like that. I think she was conscious through the whole thing and um, experienced the full pain of an unsupported, unloving birth which is way more painful than a supportive, loving birth. So, um, yeah, she didn't really, I grew up with birth being talked about in hushed whispers and like it was this horrendous thing you just had to endure. And I, I grew up, Actually, like I remember a point, I don't know how old I was, maybe seven or something, and looking across at my brother and just thinking, wow, you'll never have to do that. One day, maybe I will. And like, yeah. Um, mm, so I think oh, I was a normal vaginal birth. Uh, and it's actually interesting because I, I looked up my records because I wanted to have my astrology chart done. And when I um, uh, looked at the records, it's they're a bit hard to read. It's all handwritten. Um, it's really interesting because my mum birthed me in virtually the same way that I birthed my first child. So I kind of, I, and I didn't know the story. Like my mum didn't really talk, as I say, she didn't talk about it much. And then over the years, she'd forget, um, like, you know, I actually didn't think to really ask her until she was much older and she'd go, oh, yes, so this happened and that, oh, no, no, but that was Abby, not you. Oh, I can't quite remember. Um, so, and then my mum, she developed dementia at the end of her life. So, you know, there was no way of getting a story then. Um, but what I can see is that she got to hospital, the labour was delayed the way it is, and they augmented the labour with Sinchosinin. And eventually, after lots and lots of effort, um, I was, I was born. Um, so, um, yeah, so I grew up afraid of birth and but having this sense that, oh, one day I suppose I'll do it. But I didn't. I actually, for the longest time, thought I was barren. Like, and actually that word, it's interesting. Um, I, and I, I have no reason to believe that because when I did eventually try to get pregnant, it happened like that. It was straight away. Um, I, I just saw for me seeing, like growing up, seeing my mum underneath piles of dirty nappies and 
I just saw motherhood as this really oppressive test of endurance. Um, and I didn't like the look of that. And yeah, so it wasn't until I was 36 before I fell pregnant. Mm. Is there anything else well, you uh, want me to fill were in? Were you nursed? Did you know if you were breastfed? Yeah, I was. I was breastfed. I'm pretty sure I was. Um, but my mum struggled with a lot of illness with her asthma and medications and stuff. So I, I think I got a fair bit of cortisol style medication through pregnancy yeah. and, um, and, wow. and in the breast milk. And it's interesting because I have cortisol regulation issues now. Mm. Um, and I've always had a, heart, a high heart rate. Mm. I, I don't know if that's any connection, but I've always had a high heart rate, even in resting. Mm. Um, and yeah, my mum took, took medication through that time, you know, the Ventolin and all the other puffers and stuff like that. And she actually also had an x-ray with me, um, of me, because they suspected that she was carrying twins at some point. So she had an x-ray. Can you imagine that happening these days? No. Well, they didn't have ultrasound in those days, so. Yeah, they were no, thymuses no. and all kinds of horrible things. Oh, my God. So, yeah. And, yeah, but so I'm pretty sure I was breastfed, but I noticed with my um, other siblings as they came along, um, because I got very involved in helping with the care of younger siblings and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, lots of... Uh, that I did notice after a while she would start supplementing with formula. I think she struggled with milk supply uh, with because of the medication and also because she had a whole bunch of other kids. Um, although when I came along, it was just me and my older brother who mm -hmm. he was nearly five, so not as demanding as a little toddler, um, but she may have done the same Thing. you know back then there was a lot of interference with breath oh look, there still is but there was a lot of lack of uh acknowledgement of the value of exclusive breastfeeding and how to support a woman that you know yeah. it's amazing what happened how much milk you make when you just rest and mm. all of a sudden you know you've got so much milk when you rest mm. yeah so um Early childhood memories. Uh, how were things with your brother? Was he uh, uh, envious of you or supportive and any sibling rivalry? Not really with him because he's a lot older. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a boy, so just totally different interests. Um, you know, often on his bike and his skateboards and... Um, he wasn't very interested in me and my dolls and my tea parties and yeah, you, and my ballet dresses and stuff. Like I was really, really into floating around the house in ballet dresses and tutus and stuff. And and my mum, she had um, uh, she had a Singer sewing machine, you know, the treadle ones. Mm -hmm. And she made all our clothes that way, and she made made all these costumes for me oh, wow. um and i remember like all these all these very detailed you know you now i want this kind of color and i want i want the you know the tool to go out like this and um yeah and you know and i want sequins on the straps and i <laughs> going when's it ready when's it ready um i'm getting a, a note here saying my connection is unstable is yeah uh the audio is still coming through so it's uh, been john hey 
is my connect. Yeah, I'm, I'm still getting the audio. So let's, let's see if it opens up. Now I'm not getting anything. I'm going to pause it for a minute. So uh, your, your next sibling, was it a boy or a girl that came after you and how long after your birth? Uh, so the, my next sibling is my sister, Abby, and she is just under two years younger than me. And I, my mother planned that pregnancy. Um, I think she was on an early version of the So we're yeah. back uh, connected again after a, a 10 minute break there. Uh, so let's pick up with your mother's uh, planned pregnancy for your, uh, it was a sister that followed you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, just under two years later, she had my sister who is, um, uh, yeah, I, and well, yeah, that's right. What I was saying is that I, don't think the pregnancy was planned because I'm pretty sure she said to me once that she was on one of the early birth control pills. Mm. Um, and my interpretation was that, oh, that didn't work. And I think she found, I think she found the, the gap um, between the two of us um, very tight. And I think also taking the pill would, would have been a bit problematic for her being Catholic. So uh, she just kind of was happy to live with the consequences, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that my relationship with her, with my youngest sister, um, was a bit vexed. Like we were either best friends or worst enemies. We were, we were frenemies, Jack. <laughs> and and I think that was really taxing on my mum because she didn't have sibling rivalry when she grew up um, because her her mum died when she was a baby and then she was in a um, in an orphanage for a couple of years and then eventually claimed by two elderly great aunts of hers who didn't really want her and there were no other kids in the house and her older brothers were sent to boarding school. And so she only saw them on school holidays. Mm. So this dynamic of these two wild little girls that were either fighting or having the best time of their lives, it was just this sort of roller coaster of emotion <laughs> that she found hard. Um, she used to make us outfits that were the same, but, um, slightly different color combination. And I used to hate, <laughs> I hate it so much. I'm not like her. Yeah, so um, anyway, she just loved seeing us in these cute little dresses. And as I was dark haired, dark eyes, and my sister had white hair. So she was so fair. She looks quite like me, but this totally sort of black and white image, like reverse image of me. Um, oh, interesting. Very, 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 very blonde hair and blue eyes um, and extremely fair. Um, and so my mum would dress her in. I used to kind of prefer the colours that she chose for her as well. <laughs> Naturally. So, yeah, we were, yeah, oh, yeah, you never like, the grass is always greener. Um, and so my sister, like, I had to be the big sister when I was not even two. Mm. And I apparently, when she was brought home from hospital, I pointed at her and said, what's that? <laughs> and I think it was pretty, you know, on and off again and difficult from there. And... That would have been so hard for my mum and she didn't have her own mother or and her mother-in-law was 
in no state to support. In fact, her mother-in-law was in a room down the end and she had to look after her and her needs as well um, because she was very affected by mental illness. And yeah, she'd experienced ECT, like being, you know, elect electroconvulsive therapy um, to try and help her with her mental illness and which was probably just caused by her grief from not being with her kin. Um, anyway, um, and also having too many children and no support. Um, so yeah, I didn't really get a lot of mothering. And in fact, I had to mother my mother um, because my mother didn't get any mothering. And so her feelings needed to be looked after a lot, a lot. And many years later, I was, oh, you're talking, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Jack, you got your mic. Yeah, yeah. I to uh, there was noise next door. I was saying that that seems to be a, a, a standard requirement for any of us in the attachment field, <laughs> that we have these dysfunctional relationships with parents where we didn't get much nurturing. It's it's sort of like a, a requirement, I think. It's so common. <laughs> it's so common. It's so common. And but it doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, they didn't get mothered either, so many of them, and were in very difficult situations. And you know, a lot of deprivation caused by war and migration um, affected that generation and the whole culture and, um, uh, so Anglo culture. that uh, shame-based culture that we yeah. grew up in that's still rampant today so uh then you had a bunch yeah. more siblings after that right yeah so um she managed a bit more of a gap uh with my second brother um so he's seven years younger than me and um and then i've got two other younger sisters so we actually apart from this very close gap we were all quite a bit more separated so she had another baby at 39 my one my other sister so i've got two brothers and three sisters and so uh 12 years after i was born she had another child when she was 39 and that I don't think that was a planned pregnancy either but interestingly her last child three years later was planned because she wanted a friend for for this little girl that turned up right at the end like five years after my brother my second brother so uh, I'm not sure how much. So yeah, you've got uh, quite a spread out family. My mother had the same thing with a, a daughter or sister born 13 years after me. And she always resented it because ah. she was an accident, it, it turned out. But when my sister found out she was an accident, she was relieved because she was so annoyed at being an only child because we all left when she was a, a younger child. So uh, I was smart of your mom to, to get her a companion. Uh, my mom didn't do that so yeah. let's uh move into yes, your it was very uh like go ahead mm -hmm. oh I, I, at the time people were like people were amazed that at 42 she would after some pregnancies and and her health not great uh with the asthma it's she was never very fit and it created there was other issues with her blood pressure and so on and those last two pregnancies were hard and mm. she developed preeclampsia actually in both of them um, so and those last two births were cesarean planned cesarean sections actually and i think they were her two best births mm. uh, because my, my my brother her last vaginal birth was placenta previa actually and um so pretty amazing that they both got through that birth it wasn't 
diagnosed, because this is 46 years ago or something, um, and it was a really, really long, hard birth, and it took her a year at least to recover from that. She was as skinny as a rake and she lost a lot of blood. And it was all of us at home to care for as well. Um, mm. So the last two births, when she got preeclampsia, they were planned and she just was in the Mater Hospital just from six months, the last three months of those pregnancies and just putting her feet up like she had to. She she couldn't the doctor was like whoa you've got to go to hospital now and, and they were really loving gentle beautiful births those those last two births um mm. so she came back you know sort of more enlivened and interestingly in those last births that when she was you know advanced age so um yeah you were going to move on to something else well, yeah, we've certainly got a lot of uh, background as to why you chose your career and how you've been so effective. Uh, schooling, anything stand out from uh, grade school or high school? Uh, um, special interests, were you a, a nerd like me or a jock or a big woman on campus? Or I was... Uh, I, I, I actually, in spite of, I mentioned earlier that my early Catholic education was kind of scary and brutal, um, yeah. but there was also a lot of it that I loved. I, I, I did love some of it. Like I loved all my friends and I enjoyed the work. I was good at schoolwork. I never, I just got it all straight away and, and enjoyed it. And um so I wasn't myself the victim of too much of this brutality, but I witnessed a lot and I, it was very traumatizing. And, and just the threat of it. If you didn't know your nine times ta timetable when the nun came to you and pointed the ruler at you, you would get a, you know. So the threat of violence was always there, but mm. um, in spite of that, the nuns were, they loved music and singing. And we just used to sing all the time. We were always in choirs and dancing, ballet, ballet. I did like ballet, ballet, ballet. And um, until I was 12, 13 sort of time and, and my parents just couldn't afford the fees anymore. And, and the, you know, I was needing to move to points and I needed a lot of support to advance to that sort of thing and they just couldn't provide it. So I just let it go. Um, but it was all through primary school. And yeah, so singing and along with the academics, which I enjoyed, there was a lot of singing and dancing and playing the piano and, and the recorder too um and being in a Stedfords and all of that sort of stuff it was very um formal my education and uh very strict grammar we learnt all about and you know, adjectival clauses and adverbial phrases and like we you know we it was pretty technical and music theory um and we used to you know, solfage, the like the hand signals. I don't know them now for music. No. For um, knowing the pitch, and we would sing and like do the pitch kind of like we knew the hand signals and went along with it. And it was, you know, we didn't. There were prayers all the time. It was so formal and hilarious, and like really strict with uniform and little hats and and um, good morning, sister. You know, like. <laughs> It was, was this pretty hilarious. And then I went to, yeah, in Sydney. And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, this was in um, the Lower North Shore in Mossman, which is now this really, really shishi, ex super expensive area. But when I lived there, it was a real mix of demographic. Um, and, um, so it wasn't unusual for people of our socioeconomic 
situation to be there. And then for high school, my parents couldn't, like there was no, no way I could go to like a Catholic private school for high school, which were the only options. So if you wanted Catholic education. So I needed to go to a local high school. And so I went to the local high school and that was such a jarring experience. Firstly, there were boys there as well. And it was, it was so rough and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it's very different today, but when I was there, it, there were punks and there were fights in the street and there were, it was so intense. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so that was a pretty brutal experience. But I, you know, I have a bunch of friends including my husband, who come from that school. Uh, like my closest, dearest friends are from that time. Mm. So, um, and, and when I was there, I dropped all the music and the ballet and the, oh, I continued on with the piano, but it, it, all the singing and the sort of gay abandon that they, like in spite of the formality of the, of the nuns, they really... They were just all about the musical expression. So one minute, Sister Augustine would be, um, you know, she'd be ready to cane you within an inch of your life. And then as soon as, as soon as it was music time, she'd be playing the piano and swinging a veil around and like so into the experience of, of singing. And yeah, but when I went to high school, I didn't do any of that stuff anymore but I did get involved in art in the visual arts and yeah and then I went to uni and I studied um well I did an arts degree and then later a law degree and I didn't have I didn't um I didn't really have like a hugely connected very active life on campus. Um, I lived off campus. Um, I went to Sydney University and there was a bunch of challenges going on for my family at the time. And so I was quite preoccupied with continuing to support and look after um, the family. So I, you know, I'd do the work as I could and then um, get back to support that. My, my younger brother had a really horrendous accident um, that took him many years to recover from, and he still lives with the hemiplegia paralysis from it, uh, although he can walk. Um, but it, yeah, that was like a really big time, and that happened when uh, when I was in my first degree at, at arts at Sydney Uni. And then the law I did later, I, I, yeah, that came along a couple of years later. So then did you become a lawyer and practice law? Um, no. Um, so it's something that I, I learned, I think, from my Catholic education is um, diligence and seeing things through and nutting it out and finishing what you start. And it was just suggested to me where I was working that I start a law degree uh, they had there was funding for um, for sorry there's a plane overhead um, there was funding available for um, employees to do certain education like continued education in the department that I was working in and so I was like oh oh yeah okay I'll give that a go and um, because I never, I, I wasn't sure what my work was. You know, what, what's my calling and where am I headed with, with study or, you know, career? And I knew I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in my, I hadn't found my path, you know. It was always, always something for me. I never really understood my purpose and so I thought, oh, well, I'll give the law a go. I'm interested in social justice. So I started it and did it part-time while working full-time and eventually finished it. It's a slower way to do it. Um, 
But by the time I got to the end of the degree, the places that I was willing to work in, the interest, the level of interest, the, you know, the areas that I had any interest in, it just got so narrow. <laughs> um, and I realised in the end that, and so I did apply for some roles and I wasn't successful and that I was really pretty spent by then and not actually very interested in practising law. I came to see it as being all about creating boxes for people to be in. Mm -hmm. And I could see that I was in my own series of boxes and that I had this sense that that was why I didn't know my life purpose. And so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I never really used it in that formal sense as part of my career. Although I did for, I did work um, I moved into IT. I worked in the IT industry and in, in change management and project management, like in communications with, um, and business analysis. So <clears throat> never as a programmer, but to um, facilitate the communication between the, the, the programming team and the client and, um, and documentation and training and so on of systems. And, I worked on some legal systems, um, <clears throat> but no, I never practiced as a lawyer. And I've, I've certainly found it useful to have a law degree, um, but that's about it with me and law. Now, uh, you, you've met your husband already. When did you get married? Were you married at this point or how was that, uh, how did that evolve? So, I actually, well, we got married about 18, 17, 17 years ago. And uh, after we'd already been together for a long time, um, that period was preceded by a long struggle that I had with depression, actually. And I, in my early 20s, I was, they would say, oh, you're a high, high functioning depressive person. And because I, I continued to do stuff and work and so on, but I, I just, I just carried for the longest time this kind of grief and lack of insight into my place in this world. And mm -hmm. I've sort of hinted at that with, with, uh, you know, that the, Possibly the source of that is from, you know, way back being in my grandmother who, who wasn't a happy person. And then my mother carrying that grief and she, she ended up inadvertently passing on her grief and her, you know, the struggles onto me. And, and you know, and I had to look after her a lot emotionally. Not just me, all of us do in our own ways, um, all of us kids looked after her in that way. And um, so in my early 20s, I started to, I actually ended up reaching for medication and I went through a series of SSRIs and, and like all sorts of different kinds of pharmaceuticals to manage um, my depression and uh, none of it really doing anything the way we know that I mean, pharmaceuticals uh, are like they're one of the few sorry pharmaceuticals for for um mental illness it's just amazing that they are actually on the market because they barely do any better than the placebo but anyway um and then there's all the side effects um so I eventually got to a point when I was about 35 of just kind of, I would have these waves of, you know, coping, 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 it's all fine, and then crashing again. And um, I, I just had this sense one day, okay, I think I'm ready. And I, I went in to see my psychiatrist at the time and I said to him 
I think I'm ready to talk about my mother now. And, mm. and he was like, oh, okay, right. Okay, good. Um, and I started to tell him a few things. He just knew the score and I suppose he just figured it wasn't ever going to land with me until I came to him with it. I, I don't know. But he said, oh, you've got, and look, I, I didn't have Google at my disposal at the time to check this and, and I've never asked for my notes. But he said something like, oh, you've got reverse mirror, mirroring syndrome. There's some, some term like that. And all these lights just turned on for me. I was like, what do you mean? He went, oh, well, you've had to mother your mother. Mm -hmm. And it was so profound hearing that. Yeah, it was really full on. And it just, going back to what I was saying before about is, you know, when you shine a little light on, on, a, on, an, aware, on an issue and have this awareness of it, so much of the weight of it falls away, uh, even not doing anything else. And from that day, I started to reduce my medication and within, like, certainly within the month, I was free and I didn't see him again. And I think I went one more time um, and was like, whoa, I'm good now. Um, and, and then all these things start to fall into place. And um, my husband said, well, isn't that kind of baby o'clock? And I was like, yeah, but I'm really scared about that. I probably can't have kids anyway. Anyway, of course, like my son just turned up straight away. And so I'm very lucky that I, I never had any fertility issues. It was very easy for both of my kids. And so, yeah, that's how, that's how the marriage kind of came about like my life I, I suddenly just let go of a lot of stuff I still have it but it's not it doesn't have the same hold on me mm -hmm. as it used to have yeah, it took me to age 65 before I broke my depression cycle pretty much I still particularly with the changing seasons I, I get seasonal affective disorder too and one of the reasons I avoid winter but now, where um, in all of this, you, you had uh, your two kids. How, uh, you were in your late 30s, and how far apart were they, and what was your, their births like for you? So my son came first, and I was 36 when I fell pregnant and turned 37, like, a week before he was born and I had pretty straightforward pregnancies um, and the care I got was through the team midwifery the standard the standard care for and you know healthy women um, at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney mm. and it was they were nice enough. I was going to go through the birth centre. And so I was seeing, I was being seen by a team of midwives there. Um, but my son was born in September and it's notoriously the busiest time um, for births. And so when I went in to have him, the two birth centre rooms were taken so I ended up in delivery suite and um, where there's all the products and gears and bells and whistles and machines that go ping <laughs> yeah that one and... great. the machine that goes ping yeah <laughs> Monty Python yeah well that's stolen you don't know yeah. what that is <laughs> I do, I do. Yes, it's stolen by from Monty Python. And yeah, and just people I didn't know there. And I didn't know, I read a stack of books, like, you know, this high through my pregnancy, really, really trying to understand. I just knew that this was really big 
I knew that there was something huge in this experience and I could not touch it in all that I read and with all of the women that I spoke to, the women in my life, there was very, very little insight that I could get into what I was walking into, that crazy day that I knew was ahead of me, how was I going to get through it? And I was very fixated on how I would survive the birth. And I was frightened. And, and I figured I should be in the centre of the medical universe for this to happen safely. Um, but I, it's through this work um, that I've done with the radio show and podcasting and all the people I've interviewed um, and other books I've since learned about that the environment in your average hospital room is the exact opposite to what you actually need to birth efficiently yeah. and therefore safely. And so my birth turned into this very long saga. It was a vaginal birth in the end, but that's about as natural as it uh, was. Um, and, the, you know, the, I, it was epidural and I managed to... Um, him out under my own steam without episiotomy and gontus or forceps, which I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, but my pelvic floor did not come out uh, completely uh, back to normal, um, and so and I, and I I um, contracted. Um, terrible a terrible breast infection like a bacterial infection in the breast that really really impacted um, breastfeeding um, but after three three of the most difficult months of my life we managed to find a doctor who could support me and fix the problem and um, and he went on to breastfeed for 15 months mm. and so, yeah, it was a really, really pivotal experience. Um, it was not, notice I don't use the word positive. It was wonderful to have this healthy baby. He was beautiful. He was, he came out just ready to take on the world and so alert and never slept. It did my head in. Um, and I just, I just didn't know how to cope. I just... Yeah, I really, really struggled in that first sort of 18 months or so. But when, I, when he was four months old, I had this very clear vision of a little girl with curly brown hair coming to join us and her name and everything, it was complete, the, the picture. Mm. She was running towards me. And so that little person came and joined us where two month, two years nine months after the first birth and um and my son was there for that um because that was a home birth oh okay. um so, yeah so i just knew i felt like after the first birth i felt like I was into a paling fence at this incredible vision beyond. So like, you know, a beautiful picture of the stars or something, like something really profound. Mm -hmm. But there was a paling fence in my way and I, I couldn't quite see it. And it was just from my, the, the luck of stumbling upon home birth that, that fence fell away and I saw what really is there. And it, yeah, yeah, it was, there was this sense of loss and like more grief from, I just knew there was something there. I, I knew that all the things that they'd given me and the way they treated me and the whole setup of the room and the strangers and the, that, it's this very numbing, it has this really numbing um, 
effect that really belittles the potential of the experience. Yeah. And, and I, Sarah Buckley talks about, oh, and many others, but um, she was the one I heard first talk about the rewiring in a mother's brain um, mm -hmm. that happens during birth. And so is that rewiring to be wiring for trauma or wiring for empowerment and nurturing and, and understanding of your child? And the first experience wired me for trauma. Every time he cried, it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's wrong now? Mm. Whereas with my second child, when she cried, it was like, oh, okay, I know what you need. And, and sure, she was my second child, but you could also argue I was under more pressure because I had a really active, not even three-year-old little boy who did not have any interest in caring for the baby or anything. He was out the world and on his little trike down the street and I'm running along with her in a hug above trying to keep up with him. You know, it was, it was a really challenging time. It had its own set of challenges. Um, but I, my brain was wired very differently from the experience of um, seeing my, just witnessing my body. It's a very strange experience experience giving birth it's kind of like you're of course you're in it and you're doing it but there's also a bit of you that's watching yourself do it and or that's a bit separated from it like the thinking part of the brain's going oh so oh now we're now we're vomiting oh, okay now we're oh rushing to the loo oh now I'm on all fours now I'm bearing down really hard and screaming like a banshee you know there's this physical process that like it's very physical and the thinking part of the brain isn't needed in fact you want that to be switched off but that, I don't know if that makes sense like you oh yeah yeah I don't know if that makes how, how did you make the transition from a hospital birth to deciding to do a home birth there must be a good story in that it's a good story so as I said before, with the first one, I just had this inkling that there was something missing, something beyond that fat paling mm -hmm. fence, that crappy paling mm -hmm. fence that was in my way. And I, I was curious about that and nobody could tell me about it. And I remember saying to people, you didn't tell me, nobody told me like, oh my God, that was so full on. Like, I thought I was gonna die. And, and I actually, didn't care all I cared about was the safety of the baby it's like do whatever you have to do to me to make sure he's safe and I honestly don't care if I die not that I vocalize that but I just wanted to make sure he was safe and it's just no one talks about it and and there's certainly nobody talking about the majesty of the potential in, in birth so what happened so we moved to a different part of Sydney at this time. And we were living in this funny little old house in Northern Sydney along the train line there. And um, I, um, I was the main carer of my son. He'd never been to any preschool or like daycare or anything. He'd never been left with anyone. And I kept thinking, how? Are we going to manage this this whole going to hospital in the middle of the night thing or even in the middle of the day like he's just not going to cope with that he's too active like he'll just want to be riding his trike up and down the corridor like how do we do this and so i asked i was booked into the hospital the local public hospital up the road from where we were living um and this was Fonsby hospital and I asked the mid, one of the midwives, oh, what do people do with their kids? Can I bring my little son? And she was like, oh, yeah, you can. But, you know, if you can bring a carer, that's really better. And so I thought, okay, I'll involve my mother-in-law and who gets on very well with him and she was used to looking after him and, you know, coming over and playing with him. So we had that in my mind and I somehow came across the advice 
that it's, I think I was reading child, childbirth then, and somebody, there was a little chapter on siblings at birth, and I saw it written that it's good to maybe share some stories of birth with your toddlers and, and um, maybe give them an inkling that you're going to make a bit of noise and, um, you know, that just, and here are some pictures of birth. Now, the only pictures of birth that I could find were 99% were of them were home birth. And so I went to the local library and while he's running around the library, <laughs> I was hiding away in the childbirth section at the library and I came across a book called Birth at Home by Dr. David Miller, who lives in this region and who I got to meet just oh, yeah, a few years ago yeah. and mm -hmm. I, bought a, I, I bought a copy of his book and he, I got him to sign it and that book is one of the pivotal things. I, I remember saying to the woman when I was checking the books out, there was also a Sheila Singer, that, that was good too. There was a few of them but that book in particular, it had a series of birth stories, photograph story, photograph story on every page and so lots of different stories and him sharing his experience of learning about home birth, how he was an obstetrician and thought it was horrific that women wanted to give birth at home and but they talked him round and, it, you know, through he came to see, wow, this is so much better. And so I found that really illuminating. And I remember saying to the woman when I was checking the book out, oh, I'm not having a home birth or anything. Like, why, why would I even care about some stranger? Like, anyway. I was like, I'm just going to, I was thinking to myself, I'll just show my son the pictures of the babies being born. I'm not going to read the stories. It's so funny. Anyway, of course I did read the stories and it just lit this little flame in my heart. Oh, that sounds so lovely. I'd like to do that. And around the same time, another pivotal piece of information was um, the business of being born by Ricky Lake being released. Oh, right. Yes, I remember that. Oh, I'm on my connections unstable again. Yeah, uh, it broke up the name of Ricky's uh, video. But so say that again, if you can, because I don't remember it. Yeah, so that the business of being born. Yeah, the business. Know. The business of being born by Ricky Lake. Yeah, I remember that was a. She went on to make a sequel. Oh. Um, and and that so that came out in two, that came out in two thousand and eight, and but not in Australia. It wasn't available here yet. But my my husband, who's a bit of a computer, managed to get us a copy. Anyway, her births were virtually like mine, and so I was twenty eight weeks at this point. And I said to I said to my husband, oh, I have no idea what this film's about, but I had this feeling that home birth would be covered. So anyway, we watched the film. I, I'd not given him any information. And at the end of the film, so through the course of the film, they're describing basically my first. And he said to me, he turned around and he said, you can't do that again. Let's have a home birth. Don't you mm -hmm. want to have a home birth? So I got on the phone the next morning and got on the phone the next morning and was very lucky. The second midwife I called was new to Australia from New Zealand and her, her books were pretty empty still. And she was willing to take me on. Mm. So so yeah, three months later, three months later, I and came to see that my body is perfectly capable and that I didn't need all of this other stuff and I didn't need PD safety. And in fact, I was over service I did not need. I, I, I learned that I just needed a quiet room to be by myself, but with loving help at the end of the corridor when, I'm, when I wanted it. 
Mm. And so I just labored through the night and it was still a long labor about myself. Um, but I did have a kind of vision. So labor in the, in the, during the day, and I rang my midwife and she said to me, look, go to bed and labor will declare itself. Cause I wasn't quite due. I was 39 weeks. And so my son was having a nap. So I thought, okay, I'll go to bed. And within about 20 minutes, it was clear like that it was developing a bit of, like I couldn't just go to sleep, uh, you know, it was starting to establish. So she, we stayed in touch through the afternoon and into the early evening. And she got to my place at about nine o'clock. She, she lived a fair drive away. And um, my sister came to join us. Um, so this is the sister, my second last sister. She's 12 years younger than me. And she was two months off giving birth to her first baby. Oh. So our two kids, her youngest and my, sorry, her oldest and my youngest are uh, two months apart. And so she came uh, to take some photos and um, my mother-in-law was there to look after my son and, um, and there was the midwife and my husband, of course. And so I labored through the night and she really thought that by midnight we'd be done and dusted. But there I was at four in the morning, still grinding away. <laughs> and at one point she came into the room and this is, this I feel is a kind of induction, right? She said to me, is there anything worrying you at the moment? Mm. And it had not occurred to me that it, it hadn't occurred to me that anything was worrying me, but all this stuff came out. Oh, mm. can I do this? Will I cope? And oh, and my little boy and oh my God, I'm going to have a toddler and a newborn and how will I manage this? And I just don't know if I can be a good mother and doubt, 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 and all these things came tumbling out. And then the next thing I knew I had a big contraction. So I, my labor sort of seemed to reestablish itself through that interesting induction. Mm -hmm. and so she was, she was born in the, in the early hours of the morning. And it's interesting because I'm, um, I'm one of those, well, I don't know how common this is, but I don't have regular contractions. They're, like I did this with my son as well. I, they're differently spaced apart. They're all just as intense, but sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes one minute, sometimes three minutes, sometimes eight minutes. And so people don't think you're in established labour. Mm. And so my midwife popped out for a while uh, to get, better reception to call her sons to make sure they'd get up and go to school and then all of a sudden it just really picked up and she was born very very quickly after that and it was just so profound just feeling it mounting and mounting and mounting and just the immense power of the physical process it's like you can hear it like it sounds like 10,000 jets in your ears and and the force of the uterus is just it was like a steamroller rolling over me and um i was just in this just you know like medusa with all the snakes coming out of the head and just my eyes rolling to the back of my head and rah, just this you know it's so big it's so huge it's so like you don't know the whole world disappears and you go to the furthest reaches of the universe yeah, it still, it still really grabs me, you know, just remembering it. It's just so profound and scary and intense and you sort of want it to stop, but, you know, you you just got to keep doing it and, and, you know, sort of, it was like being on a, um, I've seen these uh, bungee jumping things where you get flung into the air and you're on like this massive, Jump. So it's like being shot from an arrow like that, but you're on elastic 
and you go to the furthest reaches of the universe, to the edge of a black hole, and you're just standing, teetering on the edge of the black hole with your toes just clinging on the black hole, or the edge of the black hole. And, and then you get brought back and everyone's there kind of, you know, all happy and excited, like, what's going on? On, I saw a photo, there's, there's a few images of my, unfortunately the photos got sort of corrupted on the computer and I don't have a lot of photos from it, but there's a couple of images of me at this time and I'm, you know, I'm just kind of looking a bit, you know, something, you know, like eyes closed. You know, you, you cannot, what she's going through is so, like, you know, this was my experience. I don't know if everyone has the same thing, but there is no facial expression for what you're going through. Mm. It, there's, you just cannot describe it. So, so, or convey it. So everybody's just there kind of like, oh, baby's coming to me. <laughs> and I'll sort of open my eyes and just think, oh my God, God, you know, you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> and I remember saying to my husband at one point during the last trip to the toilet, I remember saying to him, I don't know if, how do you go with swearing huh. on your uh, content? Uh, it, it's not unusual. <laughs> it's not unusual. Well, I just, I said, I am never going through this fucking bullshit ever again. Oh, it's, it's just so weird that I have such reverence and for birth, for the process, yet I would say that, like it's such a, there's an echo that's come now, oh no, it's gone now. Um, it's just such a dual experience and yeah, so the, the when she actually passed through me I could feel her working she was she was you know um what do you call it like you know pummeling me and you know crawling combat crawling at this incredibly fast speed like his hands I could feel her burrowing her way through and then she would rest with me in the contractions and the two of us would be there going Oh, here it comes again. And when she passed through me, it was like I kind of have this image in my mind of, you know, um, Munch, the, I think he was the Danish painter, and he did that painting, The Scream. Yeah. And it's, um, you know the one? Yes, that was me. Yeah, Edvard Munch. And, <laughs> and so then, so sort of imagine that in this black hole and that I'm in the black hole by this point. And I'm not only in the black hole, I am the black hole. And everything that has ever been and ever will be is passed through me and that I'm receiving and birthing everything that ever was and ever will be through me. It's crazy, wow. crazy experience. So I mean everything. I mean, I mean every nut and fault and smile and argument and car and and mining vehicle, computer, carrot, tomato, like every single thing, all of life and everything that we've created passing through me and so I remember this years ago now at a um, being at a maternity um, advocacy meeting with the local hospital and there was a bunch of other mums with me and we're saying we want continuity of midwifery care and you know all of these same old mantras we're still going on with we want evidence-based care etc cetera, etc cetera. and one of the mums said, we, we need to be treated in that moment like we're the centre of the universe. And mm -hmm. the, another mother sitting beside her said, 
because we are. Mm. Wow. Yeah, like I really, and that was, I remembered my, my birth had only been a year or two before that, and I remember kind of hearing that and going, yes, I was the centre of the universe for that moment. Mm. And, and the rewiring of that happened in my brain away from trauma to nurturance happened mm. in those moments. So I'm guessing uh, this had a lot to do with your eventual career and, and the work you're doing now. So can you uh, take us from th this life-changing moment to up to the present and your, and your work? Yeah, so what then happened was at that time, there was a lot of campaigning to support and preserve and in fact, improve access to home birth. Um, and I was on some sort of mailing list somehow. And so a lot of women were getting emails like, oh, share your birth stories, you know, write to there's a Senate inquiry going on right now. There's a, you know, where submissions are being received. And so I, I um, sent in my birth story and got involved in that process. And that event, so that was 2009, um, by which time we were living in this region. And, um, and, and that resulted in the National Maternity Services Plan that was um, a plan put together in 2010 that was published. And in, excuse me, the intention for that plan was that it um, be implemented by health services around the country. Um, unfortunately, they all went on to um, ignore it largely. Uh, but some, some progress was made and there were some good policies that were written that were also largely ignored, but they were, they also were used by some savvy, very hardworking people within the health system to bring about more continuity of care and to bring about at more access to women-centered care. Um, so, yeah, I, and then I became a, Two thousand and nine, around two thousand and nine, I heard about Maternity Coalition and um, became a member, and then uh, took over the running of the Northern Rivers branch Shift Maternity Coalition here in I think I did that in twenty ten, and around that same time, in that same year, um, I went for an interview on a show on Bay FM. It was two women had this show and it was about local events. And um, they asked me and a local home birth midwife, Sue Cookson, to um, uh, go to this interview and talk about the issues around um, access to women-centred care, um, be it in hospital or at home. And um, at the end, of that interview, the women said, hey, our season at Bay FM is about to finish and they're calling for more applicants. Um, you guys should run one. You guys should do a show. It'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. So it got us thinking and that's how we got started. And um, so we had our first show on Bay FM. Uh, 2010, uh, I think it was October or November of 2010. Um, and we went on to broadcast for every week for, tw for 10 years. And um, always with a team of people. In fact, I, so as the head of the Northern Rivers Branch and Maternity Coalition, as it was known then, they've changed their name in recent years to Maternity Choices Australia. Um, as the, as the um, uh, branch president for this region, I um, 
we'd raised some funds through film nights and things like that. So we could afford to pay, we paid for the season fees and the headphones and the recording equipment for interviews and so on. So I facilitated getting the show started, finding the presenters, making sure they got trained and so on. And I wasn't a presenter for the first few years. I joined about four years into it as a presenter or three years, maybe. Um, and um, because I didn't want it to be, it's not the Sally Kizak show, it's, it's whoever from the community wanted to share information about birth and parenting. And this was all information that I wish I'd known that was not in that stack of books mm -hmm. that I read when I was first pregnant, but they're the stack of books that are the most widely read and easily accessible. Um, so, yeah, Sarah that's Buckley's how all of that been. came about. Sarah Buckley's book would have been in the self-published stage probably at that point, uh, or maybe not, uh, and probably not in the mainstream in the library. So now you interviewed me there down at uh, Suffolk Park. That I seemed to me that was about 10 years ago, but you weren't presenting then, or have I got the dates wrong? That's where we first I met. I did the recording. Yeah, so I'm, I'm struggling to remember. I might have done the recording for somebody else to play because sometimes mm. we did off-site recordings, but I don't, yeah, I think I gave it to one of the team to actually play in the studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how it worked. Mm. Now, for um, our viewers, uh, because the, actual name, the name of the show is uh, Birth. Uh, that's where I get Pregnancy, confused. Birth and Beyond. Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond, yeah. Uh, and that's been going over 10 years. Wow. Weekly. Yeah. That's yeah, so that, that was going every 10 years with a team, a rotating team. There was always at least two women on the team, but often three or four. Um, and we continued to go live Bay FM until uh, June, July last year. And then with COVID, it got a bit tricky um, for our team to, because they weren't letting anybody into the studio for months, many months. We had to pre-record each show, including all the music and it was so time consuming and technically tricky, um, especially with a team, there was four of us involved at the time. And we just, we kind of realized, we crunched the numbers and realized that we were spending a huge amount of time on admin for being on the radio platform. We were also on the National Community Radio Network uh, that goes across community radio stations across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that was from 2016. So we did that for four years. And so that that became very burdensome, burdensome as well, burdensome, I should say, as well. And um, so we decided to not renew our season license with, with um, AFM from last year, but we still podcast every week. Mm -hmm. And we also, we've also held a series of events, um, different kinds of events, some small, um, but also others where we present in a university setting um, the latest research um, by researchers. Uh, which is available for the general public and clinicians to attend um, because it takes on average 17 years for scientific research, scientific findings to reach clinical practice. So, wow, you know, well and birth's that. no different. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah uh, there's been a study into that. And so... 
uh, uh, reminded Thomas Kuhn saying that uh, science advances one funeral at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's not been, yeah, there's, there's so much that doesn't reach the standard birth room. And we'd yeah. love to see that change. So we've held, held these events. You can find the content on um, all some of it. It's not all been published, but um, certainly all our podcasts are available on our website um, at pbbmedia.org. And you can find also some of the PBB talks that we held, which are these academic events. I'll put that link in the uh, description for the to the uh, this video. Uh, any other aspects of your your uh, last 20, ten or fifteen years? And in, in, uh, let's see, when was the second birth? Uh, Two thousand nine or ten? And eight. Two thousand eight. So that was two thousand and eight. Yeah, yeah, the last uh, yeah. twelve or so years of of your uh, finding your your calling, as it were. Anything we've missed? Well, um, I went on to through some of the amazing people that I've met on this journey. We learned about natural learning at the conference that um, that I interviewed you at, and. Um, that was and, and conscious parenting the way the way it's called you know so called conscious parenting but I've learned so much through the people I've learned through this work um, such as aware parenting or attachment parenting um, mm -hmm. but aware parenting discovering Alata Salter's work and her book The Aware Baby yeah, that it's was just a so life profound for me. me. <laughs> right. And she was here. It, it back, was a lifesaver uh, for me uh, too. 15 years ago, she was over here. I think mm. uh, um, we had her over for dinner because I, I had uh, been so appreciating her work. Um, uh, Marion Rose had her here, I think. Were, were you aware of that? Uh, uh, not at the time. But I remember oh. hearing about it. Yeah. 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 I, I just I learned so much from Marion as well. I I really mm -hmm. um, credit a lot of, um, especially in the early years of my parenting with my two little kids. Um, and I've been able to introduce all of this to my husband, who's very much a critical thinker, and he's like, "Yeah, this is great. This makes so much sense. Let's do it." And so I've been able to educate him and he's been such a willing participant in all of it. And um, yeah, that, that the aware baby and Marion Rose as a local facilitator and there was some camps that she organized years ago when the kids were little, where families got together to talk about the effects of the, you know, postmodern world in on parenting and and our own experiences of being parented and how we manage the big feelings that kids have and yeah learning to manage our emotions is um is such a such a life journey and also learning how to you know learning about compassion for ourselves as well so another book and it, I Pretty sure this was Marion who introduced me to this um, uh, many, many years ago. Um, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, mm -hmm. That was another massive discovery for me and so powerful for um, being able to raise my kids, but also raise myself and. Uh, recover from my childhood. Um, who yeah. is it? There's somebody who said that we spend our adult years recovering from our childhood or something. Um, and yeah, Pam Leo. you know, it's Pam still, Leo it's still. Oh, we, we have such a bad audio connection. 
uh, I think you're referring to Pam Leo's quote, which led me to finding her. Was, yes. Let's raise children that don't have to recover from their childhood. And uh, that, yeah. that's always stuck with me. Yeah. Uh, Look, and, the thing is, the thing is, I, I have a feeling that we actually, I wonder if we actually have uh, an innate interest uh, like a, a gearing towards trauma in a way like like i think my kids are they're going to be talking to their own therapist <laughs> yeah um i suppose i don't know look they they seem way more uh intelligent like emotionally intelligent than i was and uh you know even though i came to motherhood late i'm glad I did because I think I've done a much better job than if I was younger and hadn't had the opportunity to be exposed to this information. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, it's these these this information is so yeah it's been so pivotal for me and I'm so grateful for it and uh, like I'm just mentioning a couple of things there and there's. There's so many wonderful, like, and the work that you've done too, Jack, and the, the, all the people that you've worked with over the years. And seeing, seeing the history with it now, like, you know, for young parents coming through, there's such a catalogue now of fantastic information. Yeah, so it's, it's a real honour to talk to you today. Well, my pleasure. I'm curious how you got to the Northern Rivers. It was Kali Wendorf that uh, led me up here, working with her and finding out about uh, Mullumbimby and uh, coming up from East Gippsland and wow. So what's your story of how you got up here? Well, um, it's a bit of a story to that too. So, um, hmm. Where do I sort of start? So the property we live on, we bought 20-something uh, years ago, 22 years ago, I suppose. And I kind of found it by mistake. And we were up here because my older brother had moved up here with his wife and then he started his family up here. So that was, they moved up like 25 years ago or something. Um, he's a surfer and this area has always been a mecca for him. Sure. Um, but also as kids, we used to, we used to come here as kids um, oh. to visit family uh, be because my dad's family migrated to this region um, and they came from England. So there's lots of cousins all around the area. And, um, and I remember one particular holiday when I was about 12 and we were camping at Bangalore Showground. You used to be able to camp there then. So this was mm. 1980 or something, maybe. And, um, and I remember we were driving towards the beach and we came across this. I was just sitting in the car, our old combi, looking out the window and just so peaceful. And then we were going along this road where the trees meet in the middle and I just have always loved that when you drive along road where the trees meet in the middle and I said to my mum where are we now mum and she said I think this is called Cooper's Shoot and um and I thought to myself now I had forgotten about this memory right so this is a this is only just come back to me in recent years but I remember thinking to myself, she said the place and it dropped in my head and I said, I'm going to live here one day. And then the years passed. I forgot all about it. Anyway, when my brother came up here, we all thought, well, how about we just buy a patch of land together and just, yeah, let's buy some land. And back then it was cheap. And... Um, so we looked and looked and then eventually I just found this place we've been looking all day and we were buying some fish and chips for dinner 
and I'm leaning against the wall of this real estate agent. And I thought we'd look at everything like around our criteria. And then I just, there was a, an advertisement at my elbow and I turned around and went, what about this place? This looks way better than everything else we've been looking at. And so we ended up here. And then about five years ago, I was driving home one afternoon and it must have been the same season, the same, it was, but there was the same light and same time of day. The same light was coming through the trees. And I suddenly remembered that memory of me mm. saying to myself, I'm going to live here one day. So I'm pretty sure that road we were driving along is just across from where we live now. I, I, look, wow. I look across at it now. I, I, I see that bit of road now and the, like the forest there. And, um, and it really hit me as I was driving along, I got this tingles like deja vu kind of tingles and went it was it was here i led us here from 40 years ago i led us here so it's so you know and yet another learning and lesson and realization about birth yeah. and childhood and the importance of these things and how it it can lead you down one way or another and you know how much we you know the, the potential that lies for us in, in birth and pregnancy. Yeah. Um, I have another big story too, but it's, yeah, I don't know if you want to get into that. You've probably got way enough now. <laughs> uh, what's it about? What's the topic? Well, two years ago, exactly two years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And oh, this is important. Yeah. I can probably... Yeah, so um, I can probably sum it all up quite quickly. Like the reason for bringing this up is, well, it's very pivotal. Uh, but two things that I kind of realised is that the first one is the way you're treated in the so-called cancer care system is very like the maternity care system where they know best. And that your opinion doesn't really matter and like you actually get rung up repeatedly if you don't want to do all the things they want you to do um and so that was really tricky to navigate and many many women experience the same in their pregnancies when they're being hassled to have an induction or you know whatever the problem is there's so many you know deemed reasons to coerce woman into treatment um, so that that was really interesting kind of seeing how infantilized people are in the in the cancer care system I think especially women perhaps I don't know mm -hmm. um, the uh, the other thing though the much more positive sort of lesson is that I learned that um, it just occurred to me recently because I feel like I'm, I'm in the clear and uh, I had a lumpectomy and then I did the rest by supporting my immune system to mm -hmm. deal with the remaining cancer and um, I didn't want to go on the six-year toxic train of treatment that they wanted to give me it was a very personal choice many people make a very different choice and and like it's so personal it's so up to you but what I realized with that second birth I had is the incredible ripple out effect of that birth so there have been many things like I think really deciding to live here permanently was part of that birth experience how I then and then all the people that I got to meet in this region and all the lessons and other books and other films and things like that that I've been able to benefit from and, of course, my interviews. Um, but 
what I also realised is that the profound gift of that birth, it, I carried that through to my decision making for how I manage the my breast cancer care. So because the, the so the first experience was very disempowering and left me doubting myself in every way I doubted myself about everything and my self-confidence really took a hit and you know even this most fundamental of processes that you know you could say well ultimately this is why I was put here I couldn't even do that without medical support um, so when I got to have the home birth and just to see my body just do it just yes it's hard and yes I swore and yes there was some bodily functions that went on and and I, I on many levels didn't enjoy it I am so grateful for that experience because I just saw wow when you support the body with what it needs and it's usually not very much it's usually pretty basic things that we can think of ourselves um, and that we don't need expensive machinery or clinicians to be surrounding us in order to do then just stand back and watch it happen and so i learned to i i've not had any more children i was 39 when i had the other one and my second child and not ready for another child for at least four years and then after that it was you know my body wasn't so interested and and i wasn't really my heart wasn't fully in it um and you know but if i were to have a third child i just know like i just know what it would do you know it would just the way my body knows how to vomit or you know like any other bodily function yes it's a really big one and you're totally aware of it and it's full on but your body will just do it so i brought that insight into the management of my immune system and i just thought well how about i just support my immune system see what it's going to do for me and i also wanted to know i wanted to try and get to the root causes or some of the some of the reasons you know what was what was up when it should have been down and what was missing and what was what did i have too much of or whatever and i just really felt like i would never get that insight um, if i went down the standard of care route and yeah. i'm just so so grateful for my immune system and the resources I could draw on to learn about how to support best. And I just found a wonderful team. Like in birth, you've got to get a good, you get a good team. You get people who are going to support your choices. And um, yeah, I'm, there's some really great people here that I could lean on and that helped guide me. And but mostly it was just. It was really this inner sense, like my body knows what to do. I just need to work out what to do. And yeah, so that's the story, really. Great. Yeah, that's that's. But it's been another profound. Story. It's been another incredible learning journey about my health mm -hmm. and the next phase of my life, which is perimenopause and menopause and how that's not honored either, like birth. And yeah we really need to we really as women these very complex bodies we really need to take a couple of years out to as much as possible to focus on our health we deserve it and we need it we actually really really need it to set ourselves up for the next phase and um yeah, so and there's so much great information out there, so much at our fingertips that wasn't available pre-internet. You know, there's lots of problems with the internet and social media and everything else, but also lots of really great things.
Mm -hmm. I wanted to inject for our viewers that may aren't from Australia that this region, the Northern Rivers, Byron Shire, is the uh, Australian center of alternative thinking, besides being a popular surfing destination and vacation spot, it's uh, the best place for the kind of work that you're doing and the support that we need. And it was the reason that drew me up here too. So um, in case viewers were wondering what we were referring to and why, that's it. Uh, as we wrap up, are there any parting words or thoughts that you wanna toss out for future generations? Um, know thyself. Mm -hmm. uh, like, we're, you know, we're really amazing, complex creatures, and um, there's so much more within us than, than science and technology and, and our social systems and structures that are in place acknowledge and mm -hmm. we're so much more we're just so much more, you know we play with things at our peril so we play with birth thinking oh yeah you know the baby will be all right and as long as you've got a healthy baby and all that sort of stuff. but that cascade of hormones that are released through the process of you know all the way through pregnancy um, and then into labor and birth and postpartum, it's so intricate and so, so immaculately evolved. Like, and, and when we muck with it, we really muck with it to our peril. And it was so much that was just so much harder than it needed to be with my first birth and the, like the labor and the birth and the postpartum period. and and the physical issues that I actually still live with today, they're not major, but you know, I'd rather not have them. And, um, and uh, then when you experience a birth in its full, undisturbed birth, when you experience that, it's just so amazing. And you want, you want everyone to have that experience. And sometimes it's hard to talk about because not many people have experienced it and they can be a bit triggered by hearing about the potential of birth and then how they didn't get to experience that. And yeah, it's, look, I'm just really grateful for this life and all the things mm -hmm. that have happened upon and people and information and so if you have an inkling about what you should do with your life then follow it well said uh great wrap up so i'm going to end the recording now and thank you so much for sharing your life with us sally it's been uh revealing for me too so take care it's my that's